how to use tonight. Um, hello. It works. The, um, I've had an interesting uh, last five or six years in terms of a uh, trajectory of an architect. And as you know, um, architecture is a, uh, a somewhat unusual in its, its pace. And it uh, seems to take us quite a while to, um, to achieve a certain um, level of work in terms of scale and complexity, et cetera. And um, a, a series of changes, I think, have taken place over this last um, half a decade. And um, there were things that are, I think have become more evident that were, um, didn't seem to appear in the first uh, 20 or 25 years. And I'd like to mention a few of these that are established kind of the, the foundation of um, kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to show you three, three pieces of work. But the, um, I think the earlier work was um, more invested in formal investigation and had to do with the, uh, the nature of uh, the program, which was um, fairly simplistic. Houses and domestic projects and cafes, etc. And um, so the, the values were um, implicit. And um, I think today the work we're doing allows us to make those values explicit. And um, there's really less change maybe than it appears to be. I've been talking a huge amount of kind of discussion with people that think I've changed completely having to do with uh, the nature of the work right now, having to do with um, things like energy conservation and on and on. And I think if you um, look at the early work, you would see um, a huge amount of those values, because that's what we're really talking about is values that are still inherent. There's been um, certain aspects of my personality um, that have been also part of the, uh, the nature of, of how I work and um, the nature of the trajectory of my group. And a lot of it has had to do with um, an interest in um, preserving an, an autonomy of our discipline and uh, a fairly vigorous, uh, sometimes conflictual kind of position, and um, which has been based in resistance. Well, this caused me a huge amount of problems. I have to say, too, I, I, I speak as a, an American architect. As I get older, I absolutely differentiate myself in terms of practicing in this country versus uh, the other, um, Europe, Japan, et cetera. And, um, well, over this last five or six years, um, there's been a shift maybe in that notion of autonomy, and um, we've uh, come to grips with um, this notion of resistance, um, this notion of autonomy, and it seems as though we're able to, um, to find a way of negotiating a position within architecture which maintains our values, and then negotiation has been essential for the type of scale we work and the kind of collective projects we're doing. And of course, um, a lot of that was, came about through the radical increase in the obligations that we had as an architectural group, having to do with the increase of, um, of scale, um, budgets, et cetera. The, um, we got this job to do a courthouse in Eugene, Oregon, and it had to be the, the strangest kind of commission I could imagine. It's, it's not in town, it's kind of outside of town. This is kind of the city here. And we're going to be way over here, and it's really interesting because it, it, the traditionalists would have said that it, it had a place that on a courtyard, put it in the city, and this is like Los Angeles, of course. It's right at the edge of kind of a no man's land. Well, um, I started this uh, seven years ago, and um, my client is uh, Judge Hogan, Michael Hogan, um, a, a Bush Boulder appointment. And um, when we won the competition, San Francisco looked mild compared to this one. Uh, when he uh, went through the comp, well, he was part of the competition. When we actually won it, was just um, beside himself that we, he could possibly work with us. And um, we met uh, immediately in D.C. and he, he takes me to the Supreme Court, and it was really quite hysterical. It was built in 1933, and it was under budget. I'm going, yeah, right, uh, depression, right? And uh, of course, it's a steel building and a thoroughly modern building and all this. And we started there, and I haven't got. We're going to end up closer to that. I haven't got time to tell the stories, but the stories are really great. And um, this is where I was transitioning from my um, more uh, um, aggressive uh, kind of say what you need to say place to um, beginning a more negotiating stance. And um, we had this lovely uh, five-hour dinner in his favorite restaurant in DC. and. Um, He's fully behind our current administration. He's a, um, 
a very devout religious man um, and uh, comes from a little farm and, and, uh, in the western part of Oregon. Uh, luckily, my parents, or my father came from a little farm in Indiana, so we had one connection that really helped a lot. And uh, his world is uh, everything mine's not. It's stable and fixed, and it's um, more or less um, connected to the last part of the, you can't say last century anymore. It's two centuries, right? It gets kind of confusing, the 19th century. Uh, well, uh, we got together right after that, and our, our conversation was wide ranging. And um, I'm pushing every button possible. We're talking Che Guevara, and, and, and you can you could fill in the rest. Well, we came up and spent two days together, and I showed him um, a thousand images, and uh, this was one of the first. And um, we were talking about reality, and um, my claim is that um, this guy is a very real guy, and we know who he is. It's a it's a Conan the Barbarian, and uh, we know it specifically because of that maybe, but. Um, uh, this guy is actually um, the Terminator, and uh, well, everybody knows the Terminator. He's considerably more famous than just about anybody in this room, and everybody would recognize him. Well, he happens to be my governor, well, my newly elected governor, at the same time, and on and on, and um, gone into a wide-ranging discussion of the nature of um, the type of discourse we were going to have to, to find a way through this, this project. Well, I, I moved to this one, and... Uh, we were now moving to the um, broad areas of ambiguity, and uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I clip stuff out of newspapers continually, I, literally every week. I might 10 or 15 pieces of stuff, and I just kind of put up at the wall and look at it and kind of use it. And, and um, I showed him this, and he, you can imagine, he, uh, 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 and uh, first thing I said, Michael, I could call him by his first name by this time, Michael. I'm completely comfortable with the image I'm looking at, this person. This is the world I live in. And I feel comfortable in this world. I have absolutely no problem in this world. Do I agree with it or disagree with it? Maybe yes, maybe no. That's not the point. I feel comfortable in this world, and it's a radically augmented world. This could have been um, um, Kobe Bryant, right? No difference, right? And um, we construct ourselves in ways unimaginable 100 years ago, right? And we understand that these constructions are our own intentions because we're going to be moving to architecture in the next conversation and there is no in-place status, a place we can go to in terms of the nature of what a courtroom is in terms of its iconography because that's really all it's going to be about. It will not be about function. The function is, a, is, is completely a given, right? Well, um, he's a fisherman and then he, he was still working on me so we went uh, fishing for justice and uh, kept the discussion going. And then I started constructing arguments about various logics of organization, which were completely isolated from the logic or the precedent of a courthouse. Because for me, there were going to be two dialogues taking place simultaneously. One was going to be the historical one, and it had to do with precedent. And of course, precedent is the, uh, the basis of our legal system, case law, right? The one he understood. And there's going to be another one that has to do with um, a much more um, interpretive idea of how we organize the nature of our world. And I took him to, um, to uh, Paris, and we went out to Bordeaux to look at Roger's piece of work there, and I took him to Nantes to look at um, um, Nouvelle, and now it's hilarious. He saw Nouvelle, and they got it like that. Because Nouvelle, I mean, you know, the Jean Nouvelle, he loves just fucking around with people, right? <laughs> and he just, he, he must have had a really enjoyable time working with these guys. This, I don't know if anybody's seen it, the red courtrooms with this intensely uh, blue uh, um, uh, fluorescent light. Because I remember we went through it and uh, Michael just shouted out guilty. And he found it so hilarious. And, um, but what he did get, and he understood why I took him there, he's a very smart man. It had nothing to do with the architecture, it had to do with the power of the architect. Because we came away and he said, okay, okay, all right, let's keep going here. Because um, it's not like passive architect, and it goes back to resistance, it goes back to anything you want to talk about it. And again, I'm speaking as American architect, because our architecture community as a whole is horrible, disgraceful, so passive, it's unbelievable. And you can look at that huge, the, the lack of architectural output of this country is startling. I was with Peter Cook the other day, and I don't know why, we're talking about something, we're talking about Switzerland. And he said to me, do you realize that there's more architecture coming out of Switzerland, which is half the size of Los Angeles? 
than there is out of this whole country. And I go, ah, oh, haven't thought about it that way, but yes. Um, and so the notion is two autonomous forces coming together, having different agendas, and trying to come up with an idea. We spent a lot of time with the, uh, the courtroom, and it, it itself would be a discussion, um, kind of shaped it, uh, gave kind of more prominence to the bench, moved the jury slightly out of the room. I was extremely interested in the, um, the detachment of the proceedings from the jury, that you're not in the same room, you're in the same space, but looking in on the proceedings. And again, that'd be a long, long conversation, extremely interesting. And then, um, well, our reiterative process got a little out of hand. We did about 50 schemes to get where we wanted to go, and we ended up with these um, six courtrooms, and they come in pairs. And we, we wanted to um, show them in the smallest scale, having to do with the scale of Eugene and having to do with the history of the courthouse. I actually went back to, um, to Tipton, Indiana. I went back to the courthouse that my um, father is, um, his uh, death certificate and birth certificate, et cetera, are, and actually spent some time with the, the, the uh, kind of the history of the small time courthouse and looked at that, whoops. And we developed this idea, and again, it's this, this courtroom which makes up the, the generative nature of the work, which all the collective tissue which you can look at is part of. And again, it's all gonna be about section. Um, again, huge number of uh, historical kind of interests. It's just on a, um, it's a piano nobly. It's just on a plinth, and the objects sit above that. Um, the stairway is uh, the length of, uh, of uh, the Supreme Court. And then you're looking at this plinth from the court area, which is uninhabitable. It's platonic. It establishes the terms of the, of the three clusters. And now you're looking at that collective glue and, uh, that connects the courtrooms. And again, um, in construction. And again, here is the, this condition now. There's a, there's a court that, that brings in light to the lower part of the building, but this is the piece with these elements kind of sitting on the plinth, and then this is the, this connective fabric. And the fabric um, is literally the connective glue, and it is also, again, open-ended. Um, open for continual reinterpretation, because today if there's a single issue that's uh, dividing our courts, you could say our country is the radical um, kind of difference in the interpretive, or seen another way, the stasis of a law versus the nature of that law is a building block for something that continually changes and is open to reinterpretation having to do with the status of current society, with contemporary society. And um, by this time, we were actually working together because he completely got the open-endedness and it was not something he would have uh, he would have been interested in um, a year and a half, two years before that. We worked, by the way, for two years on this thing. It was a fairly kind of long process. And now we're um, modeling the movement space, which is the, kind of the most interesting part of the building. And again, it's the connective tissue of the courts. And again, um, just as about completed construction. Well, there we are in Eugene, as you know, uh, the IHOP. And uh, we clearly, um, made effort to kind of fit in <laughs> um, under construction. God, I couldn't get Vincent to remove these. It's horrible. I'm going to have to go there and cut them off. <laughs> and, oh, damn. Forget that. <laughs> Wait a minute. Ball point. Shit. I don't see the color. I'll learn to use this better next time I see and I'll be able to turn it to a color. And the arrival to the court level, which is the culmination, a knot, so to speak, of this connected tissue. And if you experience the building, as you're moving up from below, you're moving up through here, um, I've got to find another way to photograph this. If you turn around, you're going to see these pieces, and they're all now moving out as they connect you, each one going to a pair of courtrooms. And then a horrible photograph of the court itself as it kind of bands the jury room looking through that became the building block of the whole process. Thank you so much.